Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There you go. You got it. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Well, hope you had a great uh, day yesterday. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's a pleasure having you again. And uh, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. How about that? Uh, and this is the first talk. And uh, the first talk about mitral regurgitation. Uh, it was used to be said that aortic stenosis was the one uh, disease that uh, can make or break an echocardiography laboratory. And I can tell you that mitral regurgitation, I wouldn't say is a second, is, is a tie. And uh, it is interesting that aortic stenosis for you in, in the field is how do you get a jet from all these windows and how do you calculate an aortic valve area? But mitral regurgitation is not only a, an issue for the sonographer who's trying to get these, uh, you know, assessment of the mitral regurgitation, but it is even more burdensome, if you will, or challenging to the interpreter. And part of the reason for this is primary mitral regurgitation, as you know, is, which is disease of the valve uh, itself, is not infrequently either a little flail lesion or something like this that gives you these eccentric jets that color doppler as you know very well is not a volumetric technique it's a velocity technique and you can be completely fooled so i hope one of the messages that you'll get here is yes it is much more complex yes we can't rely only on color doppler because at times it can be really misleading to us and we're going to have to ask you to start being these integrative interpreter uh, for you to get really a much better appreciation of the degree of mitral regurgitation. So uh, these are the recent guidelines, about one year old. And uh, how many of you at least know that they exist? I'm not even asking you whether you read them. OK. Uh, knowledge of existence is still poor. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm glad you're here, because if I'm talking, if I'm preaching to the choir, then I'm not impacting anything. So at least know that it exists, uh, know that it uh, published almost a year ago, and actually it's free. You can go to ASE website, you don't have to, and, and download it, because it's really very important for you. And it was almost like uh, the United Nations uh, putting together quite a few opinion leaders, and, and trying to get to a consensus. So what's new in these guidelines? And they were 13 years after the first guideline that we had. So it was about time to, uh, to update them. There's an emphasis on identification of etiology and mechanism. Uh, an integrative approach I just talked to you about. There is some algorithms to help you in the assessment of severity. A point of when TE is indicated. This completely new is CMR, and we talked about CMR yesterday, and you'll have, you'll have also a much more detailed approach to CMR in regurgitant lesions. The challenge of coexisting valve lesions, a clinical perspective, and I'd like you also, if you are in the field of echocardiography, to go to the web, and they're going to be, there are actually already quite a few cases on mitral regurgitation and other regurgitant lesions. So I'm going to go through them rather briefly here just to outline a few things. One, this is the disease that we're talking about here, the mitral valve, which is really a complex apparatus. It is not just two leaflets opposing together. It is really a, a, an apparatus which is complex. Annulus is very important. Leaflets, the cords, papillary muscles, so distortion of the geometry, and it doesn't have to be global. It could be regional, particularly in the posterior area and the posterior papillary muscle. So it can affect coaptation of these leaflets. And our approach to assess severity is to look at the valve itself, look at the remodeling of the heart. And we're talking here chronic situations, not an acute mitral regurgitation. Color Doppler, which is important. You have to look at the three components of the jet. Otherwise, you'll be misled, not infrequently. You look at the flow patterns. Uh, if you're into quantitation, and I do hope if you're serious about being in an echo lab, it's not only interpreting for your patients. Your patients are not any different than somebody else's patients. But if you're in the interpretation business, you'd better know something about quantitation and continuous wave Doppler. So have a, a systematic approach. 
how to, how to do this from anatomy to color flow, pulse Doppler, and continuous wave Doppler. Uh, this is in the guideline, a, basically a, uh, a highlight of the Carpentier classification as to what the etiology, what the mechanism of regurgitation is. And these are you know, two examples for you, one primary where you have significant mitral valve prolapse that you could see there, uh, as opposed to a uh, ventricle that is not functioning well and you have secondary mitral regurgitation. I haven't talked about 3D, but if you tell me about 3D echocardiography in mitral regurgitation, probably it is among the, the most influential in looking at the mechanism of regurgitation, particularly from the transesophageal approach. So transthoracic, great for ventricular volume, et cetera, may not tell you as well as to the mechanism of regurgitation, but once you go from the transesophageal approach, you can see, I mean, I would say 100% of the cases. The actual opening and closing of the mitral valve, the etiology of the mitral regurgitation, whether there's some focality to it, Yes, it is a complex apparatus, but I think this is a great way to look at the mechanism of regurgitation. We talked about the three components of the jet. One is the flow conversions, which is when you have more flow, you're going to start seeing flow in the ventricle before it goes into the left atrium. Vena contracta, the smallest area of that jet, and then the jet area, which could be anywhere. It just tells you the direction of the jet. If it is central, it's going to be bigger. If it is eccentric, it's going to be smaller. So the central and the eccentric here have the same severity of regurgitation. One is much more impressive to the eye, and the other one is much less impressive to the eye. It may cause some swirling, but don't be fooled as to the severity being less. So to tell you the truth, we've been talking about this for 25 years. And I still have to talk about it for 25 years because the first paper emphasized so much the jet area. So we have to just push the delete button, you know, <laughs> somewhere there because our eye is just focused on this thing. So defocus as much as you can. And, you know, these are the cutoffs for vena contracta, which is the smallest area of the jet, uh, less than 0.3 centimeter or greater than 0.7. Remember also that you can use 3D echocardiography to assess the mitral regurgitation. It looks different in primary versus secondary mitral regurg. In secondary mitral regurg, this poor coaptation occurs quite a bit of the, uh, of the contour of the leaflet, which will give you this, what looks like a smiley face or a little crescentic shape to it, uh, which adds complexity to the situation add some uh, issues about how do you calculate effective regurgitant orifice area and the like. You start suspecting it when you look at it in short axis and see that short axis in B where it is not just a circle, it is, you know, a smiley face, crescentic-like, but also you can look at it for the echocardiographer that if I have a four-chamber view, which is in E versus a two-chamber view along the line of that coaptation is going to look much more impressive. It doesn't mean it's worse. It's just a thinner jet that is along a, a longer line. Quantitation, the flow conversions or PISA method, yes, it is the most commonly used. It has issues. So be careful about the issues of this PISA. Don't take it as a dogma. It is one of the parameters of so many. And we know it can, uh, it can be problematic because there are many assumptions. Number one, it changes throughout the cardiac cycle. Number two, we, are, we assume it is hemisphere, and it's not a hemisphere quite often. And uh, three is, you see this black you know, measurement of the diameter of this PISA. The first part of the black is easy to measure where the aliasing occurs. The second one is more problematic as to where you and I measure it. So where do we measure it? It's close to this convergence of the hemisphere, but this is where some of the variability occurs. And these are the numbers. They have not changed over time. ERA greater than 0.4 and a regurgitant volume greater than 60. One thing that this guideline has done is re-emphasize that these measures are still the same also for secondary mitral regurgitation. And I'm happy also to report to you that the ACC guideline on regurgitation also came out at the same day uh, back in March and actually reconfirmed this so that they changed it back to an EROA of greater than 0.4.
And I have to say also that Dr. O'Gara and also uh, Dr. Randy Martin are quite involved in not only looking at these guidelines, but also applying them in clinical medicine. Uh, and the new uh, management of mitral regurgitation came out from the ACC task force headed by Dr. O'Gara. So I mentioned that flow conversions is good, but don't take it as the gold standard. It has issues. It can be semi-quantitative. You could use it. It doesn't have to be quantitated all the time, and it has several assumptions. The other thing is that, and that's another emphasis of these guidelines, is in mitral valve prolapse, regurgitation can be only, at times, in late systole. So whatever you see by color Doppler can be overemphasized because it's not happening throughout systole. It is not holosystolic. And this is your example by M mode that late systolic mitral regurgitation occurs. And how does it look by color Doppler? Mid systole, nothing. Late systole, you start seeing the jet. It doesn't mean that that severity is the same as if it was holosystolic. And look at the CW jet predominantly late systolic mitral regurgitation. In these situations, you cannot report an effective regurgitant orifice area by PISA. You cannot. Otherwise, you're gonna send to Dr. Lowry many people that he's gonna, I know he knows more about the effective regurgitant orifice area than many others, and he's not gonna operate on your patient, luckily. Okay, last few things. Yes, you could quantitate. You could take a look at E-velocity and all these quantitations. Uh, we don't have to go through them, but these are there for you. The quantitative methods are important. They have advantages because at times you have multiple jets, you have eccentric jets, but you need to train. And this afternoon, you'll get the, the uh, uh, opportunity to look at those and see how we quantitate mitral regurgitation. And in the guideline, there is uh, this algorithm, and I've heard that it is quite helpful for many people who have used it. On one side, we have some of the specific criteria for mild mitral regurgitation. And on the right side, we have those for severe. And you don't, if, you know, the majority of these uh, points of uh, severity are, are uh, there, you really don't have to quantitate. In between, we would urge you to do some quantitation to try to define whether indeed this is, you know, moderate or severe or mild. Okay. And, uh, well, I'm not going to go through CMR because I know Dr. Dr. Shah and others will talk about that, but this is a very important also methodology that's now available, quantitative, to tell us about regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction. So in summary, quite a few things are new, an emphasis on few things that we need to do, particularly integrative approach, notice late regurgitation, so you have to adjust for it one way or another, and I would urge you to go to the library of cases. And this is the website for them, so that if you're in this field, you'll get to learn more about how do you quantitate and how do you integrate. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>